Oh, hi, I'm Kiran Maestri. Welcome to our podcast series, Future of a People. It's a series dedicated to leaders who are shaping the future of work. Each week, we engage with CEOs and senior leaders and delve into transformative dynamics of today's leadership, building a strong workplace culture and keeping employees eng engaged and motivated. On that note, I'm pleased to be joined by Mr. Amit Adarkar, who is the CEO of Ipsos India and a leader in market research. For over nine years, Amit has been blending expert data analysis with cutting-edge AI business technique, an author and a mentor who turns research into real-world results. Today, we are looking forward to learning about Amit's strategies and gathering practical tips from his experience. On that note, Amit, it's great to have you with us. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for inviting me. And it's a pleasure for me to be here on your show. Now, many leaders speak about why behind what they do. Uh, could you please share with us the core purpose that drives you and your organization and how your core purpose has shaped your journey? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question, Kevin. So let me first uh, talk about, let's say, me as, as an individual, what drives me and what is my core purpose. Now, obviously, you know, when I started the journey more than three decades ago, um, you know, you start with being a bit of a starry-eyed person who wants to change the world. And uh, there's a lot of passion to contribute in the individual capacity. But over the years, as you assume uh, bigger roles and you are in tasks, you are in charge of uh, bigger teams, you also realize that it's not about you. It's about the team that you lead. It's about the people that you work with. It's the extended ecosystem. So I think for me, the personal journey has been, you know, uh, from trying to be a damn good individual contributor to, to trying to be somebody who is empathetic and uh, in favor of giving more opportunities to people, creating opportunities for them, keeping them uh, intellectually engaged and seeing them grow. And I always use this uh, analogy of uh, Santa Claus. You know, when, when all of us uh, were small, we believed in Santa Claus and, you know, life was quite simple and, you know, you wish yeah. for things and you used to get things, right? So it was, a, it was a life when you believe in Santa Claus and believe that somebody else will do something for you, good. Um, and as you go, I guess, you know, you start, start, you know, not believing in Santa Claus. You realize the harsh realities and you realize that your parents are making up these stories just to, you know, get you to do certain things. Um, and there's this frustration that, you know, listen, I mean, I have to earn my things. I have to work hard. You know, there's nothing which will come to me free. And the next stage or the final stage is when you become Santa Claus. And, you know, then people mm -hmm. expect you to help them out. And you get genuine joy in seeing other people around you, you know, get maybe work satisfaction or work life. So I think for me, you know, maybe you can call my leadership journey as being uh, somebody who, who wanted a Santa Claus to, you know, help me out. And now I'm enjoying my role as perhaps being a Santa Claus. My, you know, my gray beard also sort of goes well with that that construct but now i get my for my for me at this stage the purpose is to make sure that uh, my team does well they're happy they get charged up they take on bigger roles and they thrive in this um, you know chaotic world and in a way it, it you know it uh, goes well with uh, the company that i work for so you know we are a global market research organization mm. we work in more than 80 countries uh, we are headquartered in paris and I think one thing which is very common to what we do is this genuine purpose that we want to work with clients and we want to help them solve their problems. So I wouldn't really say that we want to become Santa Clauses to our clients, but at least the attempt is to you know make sure that clients benefit uh, based on our expertise. And I like that part because most of our top management, uh, we are all passionate researchers. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, profits are important. Obviously, growth is important. But I think we really like what we do. And uh, we also tend to be quite a bit uh, socially con uh, conscious because as a company, we are a listed company in the Paris Stock Exchange. And, uh, you know, we, we do do a lot of work with governments, with uh, think tanks in, in helping and trying to see how we can make, make the world a better place capturing the voice of citizens, capturing the voice of, uh, you know, thought leaders. So I think, you know, at this stage, you know, uh, the purpose, I would say, is more to make sure that you know, our employees thrive and uh, they do some good work and they do good work for clients and they get motivated and stay motivated. 
and at the same time we do work which is more meaningful towards the planet towards uh, governments towards various stakeholders so it's a good confluence i would say it's in fact it's a great very soon in your career you decided you wanted to be santa claus you know most mo- most of the times you do get confused you know when you start your career you want to be an individual contributor or you want to lead the teams but the clarity of thought in terms of what you want to become and you excelled uh, 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 year after year and it all and it aligns with the core purpose of the organization that you're working as well right you're just not only leading the teams but you're making a difference even at your client side um on that note uh, i mean i would love to understand how do you put that purpose into action uh, like how do you translate your purpose in in uh, in your daily operations and especially decision making uh, processes within the organization yeah so i think for me the big learning is you know people many a times uh, get either uh, confused or overwhelmed by the designation that you carry right and yeah. to that extent being a senior leader carrying a tag of being a ceo it comes with uh, some advantages but also it comes with some dis- disadvantages so i think one of the things that uh, i i really try very hard to do is to make sure that people feel comfortable talking about things whether they are okay. good situations they are bad situations so i think you know uh, many times i've seen leaders make this mistake that leadership assumes that you have to talk obviously you know leaders you, there's nothing like a silent leader uh, you have to talk but at times you know uh, making sure that uh, everybody has an equal voice um, everybody feels comfortable sharing opinion and then maybe the leader can you know either go with consensus or can have the final say at the end of it so i believe in this philosophy of uh, you know getting the other person to talk uh, how how much ever junior that person could be so that there's a feeling that i'm getting hurt in this organization and obviously at some stages you know you might have to pull your rank and you know influence the decision but listening active listening and making the other person talk is is a good starting point i would say because otherwise if you don't do that then you know essentially you're just hearing your own voice and you assume that whatever uh, comes out of your mouth is the gospel truth and that's not really a good uh, way for a leader to function especially if the purpose is to help others you I know mean, unless you sort of you know get their side you can't really decide you know how you can go about helping people so it's like you giving opportunity for every employee kind of valued and heard as well right in a nutshell you're providing a psychological safety where every employee can raise and put forth their whatever their concerns are without not being kind of retaliated or anything kind of creating the safety yeah. so even even things like for example you know bullying we take it very seriously okay. um and you know these things are not i mean there certain things which are just not acceptable i mean uh, as a company one of our core values is integrity so i think okay. you know, uh, we also want leaders to um you know walk their talk and uh, so things like bullying things like uh, any kind of harassment i think these things are dealt with very very sternly because the message is you know uh, everybody is equal and to that extent in fact uh, one of the messages that i keep on telling my team is that we should function in a way that we don't want to leave anybody behind um and i think partly it also comes from our culture you know uh, being being a french company uh, there's a lot of emphasis put on to trust and relationship uh and i think that's something i i also believe in in terms of my own individual values that you know uh we are here to work yes in any corporate uh, uh you know setup at the end of it you know we are professionals we need to do work but you know the the growth should come in a balanced way you know if there's a growth which where, where people are also happy clients are happy you grow you have profits at the same time you know you uh take some steps to be better for the environment so i think you know mm-hmm. the, the sense of balanced growth a sense of balanced core carding becomes quite critical and to that extent then listening to people and giving them a message that you know you will be heard uh everything you recommend may not happen to be frank because you know we can't because otherwise you know we can't really run a company but at least they everybody should have a right to get heard in the first yes. place and seriously considered you as well amit and uh, it's it's a very very important where employees have given that opportunity to share their thoughts and feelings right and of course as a leader you have to always be a compassionate uh, leader where you put your wisdom on the table as well if you have to take hard decisions 
you've also touched upon a uh, culture aspect as well and i think that's one of one of my topic was uh, uh, as well so what does culture mean to you and how do you describe i know you've given very high level but how would you describe your organization culture and why is it important for your success well i mean obviously you know uh, one one can never underestimate the power of culture i mean uh, yes uh, many times leaders tend to focus on you know things like strategy and structure much more but there are enough sayings and which, which say that you know culture eats strategy for breakfast breakfast I mean, yeah uh, whatever uh, so i think to be culture is quite critical uh, now the difficult part about culture unlike let's say strategy or structure is that it's very very, very difficult to document and i am a strong believer that culture is not a you know 10 slide powerpoint document or it's a email that you send to people and say here is the culture i think culture is something that you experience yes. so to me culture are the codes and behaviors that the company functions by and obviously if there are more positive codes and more positive behaviors the culture is likely to be nicer if there are many more negatives which are which are getting practiced or codified then you're likely to have a toxic culture I mean, that's the way i look at it so there are simple elements for example if if uh, i am a leader in an organization and uh, i want the culture to be of a particular nature so it mm. has to start with me if i don't do this then i i have no right to preach uh, to say you know uh, this is the way it is and i'll take an example i mean you know, all companies have processes now you know all of us fill time sheets just to say how are we spending mm. time now you know i've been with the company for now more than 10 years and i can't recall even a single week that i haven't submitted my time sheet you know i i could be traveling on holiday ill but every week more than 10 years i haven't missed it because i believe that if i have to talk to people and say guys i want you to fill up time sheets it has to start with me otherwise and it's not as if for example you know this is public information and all my employees will know whether i have done it or not done it but i know in my heart i lose the right or uh, i lose the authority or respect to tell somebody you do it if i am not doing it so i think for me uh, these are the small measures that leaders need to take and lead by example uh, culture is also about celebrating small things you know we, we one of the things that we do quite a bit is to celebrate small things i think everybody celebrates big things right but is a small things which uh, which 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 should get celebrated much more so even to tell somebody you did well um you know that makes a big difference and the third thing i would say is a part of culture and something that we practice quite a bit that we differentiate between because in any company the things which uh, go well the things that don't go well you know even you deliver 10 projects some projects go well some projects don't go well that's that's life you, you mm. can never have a 100% i mean sachin never went out and scored a century each and every inning uh so you know you always have you know successes and failures so one of the things that we drive very strongly and i'm personally quite passionate is success tends to be you know individual so if somebody in my team has done well my message would be you and your team has done well mm. but if there's a failure failure has to be collective if something has gone wrong my message is yeah. what did we do wrong and how do we fix it so sometimes i think you know i've seen leaders uh, you know they will they will the first ones to own up success and they'll be the first ones to delegate failure to somebody else but i think that's a that's a recipe for disaster because then everybody knows that you know if i do well somebody is going to take the credit and if i do not so well i'm going to get the blame it should be the other way around you know failure is always we and success is you know you team your team did well team your team did well it's i now i should i take success for something which you know the team has delivered at the same time i should have blamed somebody for something which went wrong because i'm i'm responsible i'm equally responsible so i think these are small things you know it's even body language so you know in in at least the, the culture that we tend to have is that success we always say congrats to you and your team and failure is not about asking questions how the hell this happened it's not like that guys what went wrong can we figure it out can we discuss what do we need to do so i think the even the body language the way you communicate the way you put your message across these are small signals and my sense is that you know if you do some of these things in a consistent way culture is an outcome because otherwise it just becomes you know a powerpoint chart which says our culture mm -hmm. is like this you know 
Or for, I talked about how all of us at a senior level, we tend to be passionate about our craft. We are researchers first and, you know, uh, managers and PNL owners later on. You know, that's the thing. I need to be curious. So as a company, if you're launching something new, you know, a new solution, a new technology, I need to be the first one to understand. I can't say I'm the CEO. I don't care. Because obviously, I'm not going to use it. Right? I'm mm. not going to go and offer it to a client. But if I don't understand it, you know, I don't understand it enough to then speak to my team and say, you know, maybe this is how we can use it. So to that extent, um, you know, culture to me is essentially leading by example, staying true to the values that, that shape you, staying true to the values that the company, uh, you know, has. And I'm sure there's a, you know, good, con- there should be a good connect between the two. And most importantly, it's about the kind of communication and messaging that you do. And that has to you know, really reward positive behaviors and discourage negative behaviors. And if you do that, I think culture just becomes uh, an outcome. You don't have to put it into a PowerPoint. No, it's clearly evident as well, right? I mean, uh, but just by talking to you, I could see the sense of positive accountability that you have injected in your team. That kind of translated into some of the key results. No wonder under your leadership, Ipsos India is growing from strength to strength because you've you've kind of created a castle of that agreed behaviors that kind of shapes your values and that determining your culture, right? It's all about that celebrating small. My, my, my point, Kiran, is that uh, I, I wouldn't be the one to say under my leadership, we have done it. I mean, we have a leadership team and it's a collective it's a collective sense. win. Yes, it's that uh, most of our leaders have been with us for you know, you know longer duration. We have an amazing stability uh, at the top level, and that makes a difference because then we almost at times think as one organization, as one organism, and that makes a big difference because I think the moment leaders tend to be individualistic, then you know there's no there's no teamwork, there's no collaboration. So I think here. Yeah, everybody can challenge, but then once we all of us agree that this is the direction, then everybody buys into it. And in fact, it uh, there's a one famous quote, right? You don't build the business, you build the people, let people build the business. Going back to the culture, right? What uh, measures do you often take to ensure that your organization's culture supports inclusivity and also supports diversity as well? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I did talk about um, the message that we give out to people that everybody has a voice. Yes. Um, I think that messaging has been quite critical. Like many large companies, we also do our annual employee engagement surveys. And the data is freely shared. We discuss all the problems and we take care. For example, uh, hypothetically, let's say certain cohorts might have certain challenges. Then we'll immediately say, okay, we have this problem. Can we please get together and figure out what the solution is? So to that extent, I think openness and transparency, they are good starting points because uh, if you're not able to share some of the information with people, then the buy-in, the sense of buy-in doesn't come in. So I think starting point is obviously open and honest uh, communication. And the message is, listen, guys, we seem to have a problem here. Mm. How do we fix it? You know, what do we need to do? So I think that kind of language does, does make a difference. Um, from, you know, giving this kind of a messages. Uh, and, you know, for us, um, we, we have an interesting problem, you know, usually companies do struggle with, you know, gender diversity. But we have actually, you know, sort of in our profession, in our company, we actually have, uh, you know, almost an equal uh, gender uh, yeah. split, if at all a bit more on the women's side. Um, and I think the the, the, the the message is that, you know, I mean, obviously these things can never be constrained when you want to progress. And if you have any special requirement, again, talk about it and we'll discuss and we'll move on. So my uh, my, my, my strong belief, uh, Kiran, is that many times, uh, you know, problems arise or problems get bigger because we don't talk. So mm. talking both ways. Uh, as an organization being open with people and encouraging people to be with open with the organization. I think both things are critical. If either things or one of the things don't happen, that's when the problem starts because then, you know, then people start making their own conclusions and there is rumor monitoring and all of that. So communication is always, always good. Now, it's very interesting, uh, Amit, you also said that, you know, you do the uh, often enge- employee engagement service, right? It's it's a pretty good to to even know how your employees feel, you know, apart from they kind of sharing, giving that culture of open transparency where they can come and share their views. But doing that 
uh, employee engagement survey. In fact, I was looking at some of the, uh, the data points, right? Almost in India, 70% of our employees either disengaged or actively disengaged. And in fact, uh, uh, at least in India, we are doing much better than uh, 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 if you look at the global statistics where globally only 23% of workforce are engaged. So clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done as well. Um, on that note, uh, Amit, you know, you've shared a lot of touch points as well, right? What are you proud of? Uh, or perhaps do, can you think of any specific programs or, or strategies that you have run kind of to support employee development and career growth? Yeah, so I think, you know, I mean, I can sort of go on and talk about multiple things, but I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, I think one of the challenges that we see with, with today's talent scenario is obviously, you know, people are much more confident. They have this belief that they can do much more. Um, but at times, either they are not clear what they want to do or the traditional hierarchy in an organization, which restricts them uh, from doing more. And let me give an example. Now, any, any company will have a series of designations and pre-decided hierarchies. And, you know, the assumption is that if I do well, I will get promoted to the next level, you know, and then get promoted to the next level. That's the classical kind of thinking in any organization, right? Now, what happens is that if if that's the only way of progressing in a company, the message that you're giving is you need to think linearly and you need to okay. look at somebody who's above you and try to be like that because that's the only way you can progress upwards. So one of the areas that we are working on really hard in the last three, four years, and especially after COVID, is to tell people that growth is not only linear and it's not only vertical. Growth can be horizontal and it can be non-linear. Mm. So which means that if you're growing, don't just think about designation, right? I mean, we can create a designation if you want to contribute in a way which is great for you and great for the company. So don't just say, you know, after this level, I have to go to that level. Mm. We'll create all of that. I think let's first figure out what is good for the for the company and what is it that the company wants to achieve. And what are the areas which excite you and how you want to you know contribute. And if there's a perfect match between the two that, you know, you want to uh, develop a capability, which the company is also trying to do, we'll create a position for you. So I think that is a message. And I think over the last uh, three or four years, we are creating many more such roles which people wouldn't have thought about. So I also see, you know, people sort of getting automatically um, rotated. They are doing new things and there's a sense of fulfillment and we are able to get people to do new and exciting things every two years to three years. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing is about just trying to decode the growth and trying to sell people that don't just go with your blinkers approach and say, this is the only way to grow. No, there are five other ways to grow and it's up to you. So have these conversations with people and that makes a big difference. And that is obviously resulted in our churn being, you know, lower and much better than the industry and engagement being higher. So I think this is an example of sort of, you know, trying to, uh, I wouldn't say correct people's perception, but just widening up their horizons and say, don't think this way. There are five other ways of thinking. And we want to work with you. Tell us what is it that you want to do. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's sort of one example I, I want to talk about. The other example is in terms of um, wellness. Now, obviously, you know that after COVID, uh, mm. everybody is focusing on employee wellness. And, you know, as, as, as a multinational, we do the same things. So we have loads of doctor sessions and yoga sessions and you know, Zumba classes and everything. You know, we do all of that. One of the big insights we had, especially after COVID, is that, you know, the concept of wellness is getting redesigned. Typically, we look at wellness as, classically, we look at wellness as physical wellness. Right. I think over the years now, mental wellness is also becoming a strong part of it, right, which is okay. But we, dis we, we felt that there is something even beyond mental wellness, which is that the kind of wellness you perhaps you uh, seek when you do something good, not for yourself, but for somebody else and that somebody else could be maybe an underprivileged segment of the population, right? So we, when we started doing, we realized that there are a lot of people who actually get an extra kick and their bonding with the company goes up if they feel that the company and they are coming together to make things better for somebody else. Now, as a company, you know, as a global multinational, we, you know, we have a foundation as, as a part of our uh, CSR obligations. Also, you know, we work with charities. But in the past, we always looked at some of these initiatives as an initiative to contribute financially. 
you know you need to give x percentage of your profit towards uh, towards the csi you do that you know we have, we have a foundation so you know support charities but then we realize that you know getting employees to be part of this initiative you know they can suggest charities that we can work with get them to be part of volunteering get them to spend time it it has two benefits i think one thing is whatever financial help we are giving to various charities there is a higher sense of accountability because you know employees are actually going and seeing whether the money is getting well spent and the second thing is employees are able to contribute to volunteering and just visiting you know mm-hmm. offsiteing now the big insight that we had was that if employees start doing that um it adds to their well-being it's not just the health you know i mean we'll do eye checkups and you know and blood test and tell people you know whatever you know your parameters are not okay please take care you know manage your work life balance we we have uh, employee assistance programs you know mental well being programs to tell them please take care of your mental health but this is technically is not well being you know we and it's voluntary we say you know we are doing this uh, work with an amazing charity and they have an engagement they have a graduation ceremony so we actually you know do a lot of supporting in the area of education and children because as a as a research organization what is close to our, our heart is knowledge education knowledge, all of that yeah. so i think we do a lot so we say okay you know we are supporting this charity and you know we have a sort of mini graduation ceremony do you want to go and attend and give them prizes you know and that just adds to the wellness well being so we we are trying to broaden the definition of what could constitute wellness and getting people more involved and i think that is good for people they feel connected more to the company because otherwise you know after covid i think we spend half our lives talking to screens and there's no connect so i think these are the kind of initiatives which also add to the level of connectedness and engagement um and I, at the same time you know employees get a sense that i'm doing something which is not just you know my work and generating profits and growth but i'm also doing something uh, well for the for the society and i think that's that's what we want right and that's what employee seeking as well it's all about being connected to the company and how do you do that having an them an opportunity to have those multiple connections and yet the company cares for their own well being as well and some of the strategies that you've shared with us was very practical in a way you know employee assistance programs these are all great but you're just going about beyond just to ensure that it's not only there but it's 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 been used and implemented and executed right and i want to touch base again uh, amit uh, because you have such an extensive experience from a leadership standpoint right what key qualities uh, that distinguish a good leader from a great one especially in today's business environment yeah so it's it's it's, it's a very difficult question because leadership as a construct is evolving so fast and especially with with technology post covid it's it's a moving goal post there's nothing which is constant but i would i would pick up uh, three key aspects which uh, which actually, especially in today's world are critical i think one thing is empathy yeah um, gone other days when a leader is supposed to be this strong patriarchal um, person who's supposed to give orders and you know things will happen i think leaders need to practice empathy uh leaders also need to be vulnerable because you know anybody who says i have got this world figured out is bluffing you know the world is far too complex right now than what it was 5 years ago uh you know we 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 call it uh, poly crisis I and mean, there was a time when uh, world faced one crisis at a time you know maybe in in the in the 40s there was a second world war in the 70s there was a opec oil crisis in 2008 we had the banking crisis in the us so it was world was simple you know one crisis you know what you're tackling with now we have multiple wars there's inflation there's recession there is you know all kinds of tech phobia there is yeah security insecurity around gen ai so there is too many crises happening at the same mm-hmm. time so it's poly crisis right plus you know we describe the world as vuca and you know all kinds mm-hmm. of four letter acronyms so if anybody says i know exactly what i'm doing and i know how the future is going to look like that person is bluffing so to that extent i think a leader who's not vulnerable enough to uh, understand that you know i can't figure out everything on my own and i need people to help me out um that is critical so i think the dual power of empathy and vulnerability uh, i think that's a good combination because to be vulnerable you also need to practice empathy because otherwise mm. sort of uh, unless you can't connect with people show humility you can't so i would say you know uh, empathy and vulnerability are two of the criteria which is very critical and the third one i would say resilient 
because uh, with so much of uncertainty so much of changes mm-hmm. a leader who gives up too easily uh, or a leader who also keeps on making changes too much um i think that's 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 a big challenge because you know people do appreciate stability people do appreciate um some sense of continuity because you know i mean you you see what is happening in different ecosystems i mean you know our world is shaped by short term financial pressures there's a lot of hiring then there's a lot of firing there is buying of company there's selling of company so i think you know if if i were to be an employee um i'll always be second guessing that you know what is the company going to do to me what is going to happen to my job and it's not a very healthy situation because anybody who's you know into this insecure frame of mind it's too much to expect that person to deliver to his or her own uh, capability right so mm. to that extent people do appreciate a sense of stability um and the stability doesn't mean that you give dishonest messages about everything is fine and you know nothing is going to go wrong not that right and that's why i think the combination of empathy and and resilience and vulnerability i think that that is something which is a which is a really good combination to have because at times you know stability could mean that going and telling people that listen we facing these two problems and everybody has to come together and you know helping it out uh, and i think one uh, example i can quote is that you know see we are market research and insights organization mm. so our lifeline is um, depends upon our ability to talk to people Mm-hmm. and you know carry out surveys and observe them and meet them in focus groups so essentially we always need to talk to people that's the way we understand um you know some of the issues that our clients have then we go back and say okay we spoke to your people and this is what you should do when the first lockdown happened in 2020 covid that was a big test because pretty much you know the world was locked in now if i can't talk to people how do i run a business how do i you know present solutions to client and that's when i realized that you know i mean i i remember doing this town hall when when we said okay we are just packing up today and from tomorrow onwards everybody is going to just you know function from home because the lockdown was announced so i had this town hall i remember and i you know i was i was open to the extent that i could have been and i said listen guys we have a problem because you know for us the lifeline is talking to people and you know now we can't do that so we need to figure out what we need to do from us our perspective will make sure that you know nobody is getting penalized for this you know so at least because people are concerned about will i have a job we we at that stage uh, we did not let go of anybody because we said it's not your fault that you know the world is locked in uh, but we said at the same time you know if you can come back with solutions about how we can navigate and believe me you know within 48 hours people came back with so many solutions and we kept the business going during during that phase we launched a lot of new solutions we started digitizing the business quite aggressively and i think in a normal situation i don't think this this would have taken maybe 3 years or 4 years but within 48 hours people just pulled in together and uh, we were the first ones to bounce back within our industry right. and clients appreciated this uh, you know our employees appreciated it and i think the simple thing was to just go back to the saying that guys we have a problem and we need to figure out a solution and you know we just counting on everybody to come back and raise your hand and say i have the solution and we'll make it work of winning teams right when you got a winning exactly. teams the 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 uh, what you said the creativity comes from your workplace itself uh, you made a very good point as a leader you don't know all the answers right being vulnerable and asking for help go a lot uh, a lot of extent as well so you have to do you want to add something there uh, amit no 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 i'm good i'm good so we will will uh, have a bit of more of uh, three fun questions knowing more about you i know you've shared a lot of wisdom when it comes to leadership culture and employee engagement we want to know more about uh, you as well can you share a habit or a personal practice that you that basically you maintain that helps you to stay focused and effective in your role as a ceo so there's one thing which uh, i have been doing for quite some time and which i think genuinely it does help me is that i journal every day okay and this is a practice that i picked up uh, quite some time ago actually i've been journaling for quite some time and for me my typical ritual is that before i go to sleep i just sit for 5 minutes uh and just run through the day that i've had and uh, anything significant any any experience which was positive negative okay. any learning i just you know i i have an app and i just put it down and it i think it helps in two ways one thing is you know over the years then i create like a library of thoughts 
I can always go back and I can always see and say five years ago, this is what I was, this was fascinating to me and this is what I learned and now what is it? So I think I have this longitudinal um, history of how I have changed as a person and what are the kind of experiences that I had few years ago and now. And the second thing is that you know, journaling for me, it's a process, right? Because I need to just capture something. But that five minutes of introspection at the end of the day, it's very calming for me because, you know, otherwise a lot of us take our problems to bed, um, you know, our stresses to bed. And maybe, you know, for me, just a way of almost like playing back the entire day, purging out some other things that I should not be carrying, noting down some of the things that I should carry. And then it's like, you know, I have a clean slate. I can go and have a nice sleep and be ready for the new day. So I think that has been a big thing. In fact, you know, uh, I, the, the book that uh, I wrote, um, Nonlinear, I, I talk about the power of uh, journaling there and how it helps you in almost like, you know, purging the mind. And see, if, even if you look at sleep, you know, uh, uh, scientifically, the, the REM part of the sleep that we have, it's the way for the brain to purge, you know, and okay. sort of, you know, almost like reset and be ready for the next day. So for me, journaling and that introspection is a, you know, it's my way of purging my brain and sort of, you know, get rid of the negativity, capture the salient positive points and be ready for the next day. So I, so I would is, highly recommend so journaling it, and introspection. But you don't miss it. You tend to... You be yeah, it's, it's, it's a habit. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's, a habit. it's difficult. Okay. I, I, you know, I don't feel yeah. nice if I, for whatever reason, you know, I'm okay. traveling and uh, I'm not able to devote time. It, I feel uncomfortable. Uh, Luckily, you know, now we got the power of app. At least you uh, uh, you don't have to carry the book everywhere, right? Otherwise, no. Obviously, <laughs> in the earlier days, it was like writing down. But this is much easier now. But and I think we often talk about leaders being self-aware and being self-compassionate, right? I mean, pretty much uh, in a way, uh, like you being aware of yourself and we often talk about being gratitude, right? Just be, just be happy with, I mean, positives and negatives, whatever, right? Uh, having that journaling, that having that sense of gratitude. Uh, kind of makes a lot of difference. I mean, I personally loved uh, the journaling, which I don't often do it. Maybe uh, that's one of the key takeaways as well. You also touched point about your book, Nonlinear. And that's something I wanted to find out. Well, I haven't read it myself. I mean, I want to understand what are the three key takeaways that I would get it by reading the book? I think the first takeaway is, you know, uh, I, I start in the book by taking a look at how technology has evolved right form you know when humans sort of uh, started you know hunting gathering from that time till till gen ai and I'm, i've captured the the history of technology into four epochs and more okay. importantly i've looked at how has technology impacted human beings our brains our bodies throughout this journey of 60000 years and it's quite fascinating to me when I started mapping this that, you know, mm. the today's technology, the way it affects us is very different than, you know, maybe it affects, affected humanity 200 years ago or mm. 2000 years ago or 20,000 years ago. And that, that awareness is a good starting point because, you know, we take technology for granted. You know, technology is all around us. We don't even know that we're using technology in everything that we do. But we never think about technology. You know, we're using technology. We never, we never think about it. So I thought this is a good way of uh, you know, looking at the history of technology and more importantly, how it is affecting us. So that would be the first uh, key takeout for me. Just just getting that awareness and appreciation of, you know, what does the technology do to me, to my brain, to my body, all of that. Uh, and which actually, is, is, uh, you know, segues into the next section where I say, uh, having understood all of this, you know, having understood how our bodies and our minds are affected, in today's scenario, where Gen AI is the buzzword, and Gen AI is like any uh, is unlike any other technology, because it talks like uh, humans, it walks like humans, you know, and it's difficult to now differentiate between am I talking to a human being or a bot, right? And you know, we have this deep fakes and all kinds of controversies going around, and this is just a start. You know, we are we're going to progress quite rapidly. So, in a context where you know, in so far it was humans and tech. But now it's it's difficult to figure out, you know, uh, mm. the two will start, uh, you know, almost like uh, merging together. So in that context, you know, what does it mean to be a human? You know, what are the challenges we'll face? Uh, and what are the opportunities that we'll, uh, you know, sort of uh, face? And one of the things that the book talks about is the concept of a digital renaissance. 
Uh, you know, if you are familiar, we we had this uh, the neo the classical Renaissance in the 14th and the 15th century in Europe, where a lot of wonderful things were uh, designed. You know, the printing press and the telescope, and that's where on the exploration of the world with Magellan and Columbus and everybody went around. So this huge amount of exploration sciences came about. So I'm just saying that the kind of situations which existed in that part of the world in that part of the humanity's timeline. same thing is going to happen now and we are going to enter a world of digital renaissance where people who understand today's technology well and they actually know how to leverage the positives of the technology well will actually you know come out better as a part of the digital renaissance and people who don't understand the tech or don't understand the watch outs or the negatives of the tech they'll actually lose out uh, the entire digital renaissance so that's the second big concept that i introduce and in the third uh, uh, part you know i introduce my own framework and i call it the desire framework it's desire is actually it's a acronym of four different things and i talk about to make the most out of this technology and to come out uh, a winner uh, as as part of the digital awareness so what are the kind of things you need to do uh, and then there are four things that i describe as a part of uh, the desire framework and journaling is one of those components embedded okay. in one of the elements it's a, it's a very clear i mean it's 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 quite required especially in the era of generative ai right when that has a profound impact the way we live and work as you rightly said it's just not any other change it's literally reshaping the way we even we approach our jobs right uh, the way we even work and it is affecting everywhere just not professional or even on a personal life as well and i could see where this book can add immense value uh, i'm going to look into that uh, personally yeah. on myself and finally uh, uh, can I, i can i just add uh, one more thing just just sure. because uh, if if i have time you know i i did talk about uh, you know the value of empathy the value of uh, vulnerability see in the world which is sort of getting more and more dominated by gen ai Yeah. Uh, my sense is that for the leader these things are still very human you know because you can get ai to do a lot of these things but i think we are far away from a stage where ai will actually be vulnerable or show empathy i mean at least the real empathy obviously you know you can have a conversation uh, and uh, you know we can actually have a prompt which says that you know maybe talk like a person who has a lot of empathy but that's still artificial i think what is human to us is still the fact that you know we 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 develop relationships and we are vulnerable and you know we show in empathy towards uh, other human beings and other living things so i think those things will always be there so there's this interesting debate about how ai is going to replace people i think you know the human will still be in charge is what i believe and as long as you you know sort of exhibit some of these values of uh, showing empathy showing vulnerability i think you know there is a lot of hope i mean i i completely agree i mean it's such a debatable topic right i, I i'm of the firm of me opinion that uh, it it doesn't change the way we lead right i mean going back to the point of i uh, empathy or human connection and a compassion is something irreplaceable and that's what you i mean that's what a uh, human uh, we as a human right we are kind of thrive for the significance right love business love or personal love caring uh you know these are the human needs which can never be replaced and um, finally uh amit uh, what advice you would give to younger version of yourself if you had to give an advice well i i mean i don't know i i wouldn't actually change anything in a way so i mean i don't really have any advice where i can go back to myself 25 years in the history and say oh you're doing this wrong you know and change so that something will change because for me you know i have enjoyed each and every waking moment of my career uh, you know the i chose this career because this is what i wanted to do and i never had any second thoughts about why am i choosing this uh, for me every day is a learning experience i mean i can't really think that oh this part was really bad and i, I wish i could go back and um, you know yeah. sort of change anything so to that extent i don't really have any advice to do any course corrections or changes to my younger self um but yes maybe as a motivational pep talk you know i will just go back and tap myself on the shoulder and say you're doing well you know just keep at it what you're doing is good just keep at it compassion <laughs> yeah uh, just be caring to yourself yeah, okay that's that's great i mean look i mean it this has been brilliant you know you share a lot of wisdom lot of insights practical tips as well in terms of being empathetic being vulnerable being authentic right having that resilient attitude to all the way to some of the strategies on employee engagement 
to uh, to to culture where think where everybody acts in a similar you know in a, and acts in a sim same way and to your personal habit of journaling it's been quite enriching and thank you really appreciate for taking your time i know despite your busy schedule uh, you have taken the opportunity to uh, to talk to us and share your views that means a lot and we really wish you all the best uh, amit and i'm going to uh, put in my description about the uh, book as well on linear i'm going to pers personally look into it because it sounds very exciting um, and interesting i'm 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 an avid book reader myself so i would definitely look into that uh, yeah and I, i think please do share because you also mentioned that you know you 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 authored a book so please let me know the details and i'll i'll also make it a point because i think yeah reading is a great uh, hobby to have it gives you so much of perspective into yeah, yourself and also with others i think it's it goes to the fact we we have the similar background from a research background <laughs> maybe that helps a lot as well but thank you amit it's been really uh, uh, kind of you thank you and we'll certainly be in touch sure pleasure thanks a lot kevin